Hello and welcome to the Heresy Lodge. I'm your host Dylan and Cooper with our constant co-host over here, Gavin Franklin. Guys, we are here this week to talk about Red Rising from Pierce Brown. Pierce yes, Brown? that's right. Hell yeah, look at me. I know authors. That's good. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to recap Gen Con a little bit. Um, that's where we were last week and it was a lot of fun. And, you know, people should go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For all that, though, as always, hit us up on Discord. Find that pinned to our Twitter at Heresy Lodge. Email us at theheresylodge at gmail.com. Check us out on YouTube at the Heresy Lodge. Check out some merch. Buy yourself some merch. My birthday's coming up, and that's the best time for you to buy merch. Makes sense to me. Yep. Uh, Gavin, what are you drinking, good friend? Just bourbon. Hell yeah, that's what I like to hear. That's a man's drink right there. There ain't no pussy shit on this show. Haberdash bourbon. Nice. Which is that the one of their batched ones? Yep. Small batch. Nice. Fifty six percent ABV. Yeah, that's bourbon for you. That's a lot. That's a very <laughs> strong bourbon. Yeah, well, this shit's so good. I love haberdasher. Yeah, it's very good. Um, I also have their gin down here just in case they run out. Nice. How about you? <sighs> I would like to emphasize again how much I adore my wife. <laughs> this is another one of those instances of... Tell me more. This sounded really interesting, so I thought you could have it on the podcast. Oh, yeah, cool, babe. Can't wait. <laughs> Are you fucking ready for this? I'm ready. So the so, drink is called... Wait, let me take a guess real quick. Okay, you're not going to guess. I'm thinking there's a few options. It's going to be like something like cinnamon or banana or chocolate nutmeg. No. Lay it on. You ready for this? All right. The drink is called Ray. It okay. is a sparkling golden ale with lemon flavors and ginger. So it's like a Sprite. No, because Sprite's good. <laughs> this is a golden ale that's carbonated with lemon and ginger. It, like, ale. My mouth doesn't understand what's happening. Like, It's not a beer, but it's kind of a beer. Mm, that's weird what's it called ray r-a-e is that like what's the brand is that it that i don't fucking know this is all i got to work with i think it's ray yeah <laughs> i don't know man it's weird i'm not personally a fan um low calories though so i guess that's cool 4.2 percenter Oh, it's from Upland. Yeah. That sounds right. That's strange. Leave it to Upland, you know, to do some real hipster shit with beer. Yeah, I just wish it was... It's so fucking weird. I don't even know how to describe it. It freaks me out. Mm. Speaking of beer and drinking, let's talk a little bit about Gen Con. Yeah, we so, did we did a little bit of drinking there. Yeah. And I think we've we've both noticed that we may be getting old. Yeah. I can attest that I am getting yeah. old. <laughs> Compared to last year, we probably didn't drink nearly as much. I'd say probably like three to four drinks a day maximum. Yeah. And it got to us. Not just like, not really drunk. Like, we just kind of felt like shit most of the time. Yes. I also, like, wasn't sleeping. So it was a double whammy for me. So tired. <laughs> yeah. There were quite a few nights where, like, it's it's so frustrating when, like, you go on PTO for work and you sleep less than when you are at work. Yeah. Have a kid. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, thank you. <laughs> So yeah, it's been uh it was a good time. We played quite a few different games. 
What what was your favorite one that we played? Oof, that we played. I'm between Nova Roma and Mistwood. Mistwind. Mistwind. I we were so confused lot. about the name of <laughs> this game multiple times throughout the con. Yeah, so Mistwind was really good. I think Nova Rome is probably the my favorite one. That we it was a lot of fun. Things like there we go. Yeah, I think um, I really enjoy. So Nova Rome is very like Euro style. You've got like sixteen different actions that you can take. Really, it's eight, but then there's combinations of the actions. Yeah. So it's what it's real. Is it sixteen? No, it's four. Yeah, four times twelve. Six. Yes, yeah, sixteen. That's only four. <laughs> and you can alter in different ways and i think the best part about that game and something that game should look to do is have really interesting two-player rule sets yes is that added a couple elements that made it a lot of fun um the biggest disappointment to me and people are probably going to hate this is i did not like arcs as much as people say arcs was fantastic i liked arcs but i don't think it's like the best game i've ever played by any means it's i would so put it layered. like average yeah, it's so layered to where like like one thing that I always thought was weird about the game is like you get to choose as you play like how you get victory points. Yeah. But none of the options ever seemed good. Yes. So like you as a person had to come up with a strategy, but every time you got to choose victory points, you were like, I'm I'm gonna pass. Like I don't I don't know if I actually want to go for victory points here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have it now, so maybe on like another playthrough it'll be different. I don't yeah. know. We'll see. Missed one was a lot of fun. Um, it's a trading game where you're building like a trade empire. The coolest part about that game, I mean, the art, the way they did the cards, the miniatures, like it's just a really fucking pretty game. Um, so big, big props to Missed Wind. And the thing about that game that the reason I don't think it's my favorite is because the amount of time that you have to sit there to just perceive what your turn is going to look like. It's <laughs> one of those things where it's like, okay, the round's over. Everybody sit and think for like 20 minutes and then you can start playing. Yeah. Cause you have to like discard one of your, basically a move. So you're like, hmm, I can't. I, yeah, if, I, the... if I discard this, then I'm not going to do that. Yeah, the whole like <laughs> concept of the game is you get these five chips every round and they're numbered one through five and you have to discard one of them. And the like base of the gameplay is like each side of the map has a different type of action that you can take and each action has five numbers. So they're slightly different. So like you have to place a chip on one of those numbers so like if you use your two on the left side you can't use your two anywhere else yeah and then but if someone else uses the two on the left side you can't use your two on the left side so it's like then you're then trying to <laughs> yeah you're like trying to formulate a plan by saying okay like i have five actions but really I only have four of all the things around the board what are the four things i want to do and can i do that with the numbers that i have so like if there's two really good things on like number three here and number three there, you can't do them both. Yeah. <laughs> or you have to be like, huh, if this person takes that, can I use this number anywhere else? If not, like, oh, do I keep this? <laughs> yeah. And you get to this point where it's like, it's a fun game. Like it's fun talking about it, right? It's fun like thinking about how like cool of a concept that is. But unfortunately what that really boils down to is you're just like super planning. Like every round, you're just super planning for like a long time. So it's a real fun and concept. I think an execution would be a really good game once you play three or four times. Um, but it's a lot of um, a lot of games that we played. One of my biggest pieces of feedback are like, give me, give me some diversity and like some factions. Like let like if I choose my blue whales, like what like have the blue faction do something unique, have some sort of ability. You know what I mean um and i felt the same way with nova roma yeah um arcs apparently arcs has a campaign mode and i guess that's supposed to be even more complex than that um oh boy. 
which is crazy because I actually think like our group is very, very good at picking up complicated games. Especially Katie. Yes. <laughs> she beats our ass every time. My I fiance, don't know how she beats us. Oh, I do know how. I do know exactly how she beats us. <laughs> she employs this tactic called wait them out. <laughs> yeah. Like, all right, Dylan and Gavin are going to fuck themselves. I'm just going to mind my own business. Except for when she attacked me and just died. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Classic. No, so that was good. And uh, yeah, Gen Con was great. The beer, they had the beer there. We talked about that a little bit. The cinnamon roll beer. It was great. Surprisingly good. It's I'm really shocked. Good. Sun King also then had a pickle beer at the state fair. I can confirm that's the worst beer I've ever had in my entire fucking life. I threw it away. <laughs> Didn't even finish it. That's tough. That's a yeah. tough one. Man. Oh, and I, we there was one more game we played. We played Wandering Towers. Wandering Towers. Yeah. I mean, what a fun game. What a fun concept. It's yeah. Quick. It's yeah, it's quick. It's not like too complex. I liked it a lot. You pulled out the win on that one. That was a shocker. It was. Because I felt I was in the lead like so far. And then I won. I was like, all right, I'm done. I pulled out like this crazy move too at the end. Mm-hmm. Yep. I won the tiebreaker. The, yeah. One of the tiebreaker. Uh, I did, I wasn't even worried about the tiebreaker, but it came into play. <laughs> so, no, I was wondering. That was the only game Katie did not win. Pulled out one for the boys. But it was like a 25 minute game. So it was kind of a tough, like you get a half a point. <laughs> hey, man, a win's a win in my book. So we walked the halls. I think what really sucked about this year was just ultimately we didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. Katie had to work. You had a kid. So, I mean, I spent like six or seven hours at the con by myself walking around. I mean, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely more games I wanted to see. Like there was that. Uh, I really wish that uh, Space Shuttle game was out. What about that? Mm. Galactic, whatever. That was cool. It's always so annoyed to see people come with like pre-orders or yeah. Kickstarters. I'm like, I get what you're doing. I understand why. Like, come don't show year. me this badass game and tell me I can't buy it. Like, so frustrating. Yeah. And that then uh, we actually bought Wormspan on the way out. Oh, I'm sure you were super pr- happy about that one. Super pumped. No, really. I know how much no. I love Wingspan. I was actually uh, kind of surprised because like we went up and I was like, I almost guarantee you they're sold out of this game. We went like the last hour of the con. And we were walking up and there was five boxes just sitting there. No one was around them. I like walked up and I picked one up. I was like, hey, can I buy this? And he's like, oh, like they just dropped this off from the demo tables. They're like it's been open. It's been played a few times, but it's been repackaged. Are you OK with that? So like they sold out like day one of hmm. Worm Span. And I just happened to like arrive right when they dropped off the five boxes from demo. Wow. I was like. Fuck, sure, whatever. Works for me. <laughs> um, I think this is the first, well, I've only been twice, but I spent more on food this Gen Con than I did on games. Yeah, there's definitely more games I wanted to see and play, but also like bringing home games, no one's going to play with me. So it's like, man, it'd be cool to have, I guess. Yeah, we're trying to get a game group together, but I think it's it's going to be all girls. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine, you know. Um, that's probably I'll probably be a part of the only gaming group in Indiana that's all girls and one guy. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like that uh meme with like the chick on the couch and all the men behind her. You're <laughs> mm, that meme, yeah, <laughs> that meme. I remember that meme. <laughs> I've seen that meme quite a few times. <laughs> I've seen it in video form too. Weird. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else about Gen Con? I don't think so. See you in uh 2025. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'll be there. I'm just yep. pumped, you guys. It's so much fun just playing a board game at Lucas Oil. And honestly, I think the trick next year is going to be trying to go as often as we can and maybe doing like some semi planning beforehand on the games we want. I think for Dylan, like it's a pain because that's like the only time of year you get to play board games now. 
I know it fucking sucks, asshole. All right. <laughs> so like I'm caught between this like, oh, maybe we just played too many board games. Well, I'm like, but that's all the board games. Don't yeah, I had a blast. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. And yeah, so I think we just do more planning around the like understanding what games are being played. And we pick like two of them because like that's a day. If we have like all Saturday, that's that's two games. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> and then we we can use the rest of the time to walk the hall, do some game testing. That's one thing we didn't get. We still didn't get to do any RPG stuff. It's like you just don't have enough time to do everything that you want to do. Yeah. Um, and if you had like a regular gaming group, it wouldn't be a problem because you just buy the games and you wouldn't play them and you go do all the other fun stuff and then you'd go back home and play them with your gaming group. But alas, we're alone. Pretty much. So Beautiful. <laughs> so sad. All right. Red Rising. Red Rising. How would you like to start off Red Rising, Gavin? Let's... Do you want to give out let's... your thoughts first or do you want to just kind of dive right into the book? Let's do like a because if people are tuning in, this will probably be the first time that like most of the audience has no idea what the fuck this book is. Because <laughs> for Warhammer, they probably knew relatively what Warhammer is. Everyone yeah. knows what Lord of the Rings is. So this is the first time that it's like this is just some off the wall book that they're talking about. We've basically just become a book club for guys, but we're drinking bourbon and not wine. You know, it's just how it goes. Excuse me. I am drinking a sparkling golden ale. Never mind, it's just a book club. <laughs> <laughs> so the concept of this book is this is a in the future. The setting of the book begins with in, in Mars, but humanity has essentially colonized the majority of the planets in the solar system and quite a few moons. And the main character of this book um, his name is Daro, and essentially, this whole thing is it, the all society is a caste system, and he is born into the lowest caste, and the castes are divided by colors. So he lives in the red caste. The reds is what they refer to them as, and specifically, he is born on Mars. He mines, and um, the main the main point in this book is. Some shit happens to Daro, and throughout his entire life, he has been told that he is preparing Mars. He is mining this helium-3 element that's going to allow them to, what's the word I'm looking for, to not terrestrialize. Uh, um, fuck. Terraform? Terraform. Yeah. Allow, allow people to terraform planets. So this concept is like, he's a red born in the caves of Mars. And he's working to mine this helium-3 in order to allow the other cast members, the other callers, to eventually come and live on Mars and other planets in the future. And after some really crappy shit happens to Daro, he finds out that Mars has been inhabited for a few hundred years by all of society. They have very large cities, and uh, he was basically lied to. And he basically he joins a rebellion in order to uh, destroy the modern civilization, which is ruled by a ruling class known as the Golds. That's the that's the very basic synopsis yep. of what Red Rising is about and what the series is about. And uh, I have my initial thoughts on this on this book. What are your What are your initial thoughts? And then we can start uh, going into it. My initial thoughts are I really dislike it. Really? Yes. Um, now, again, these are my initial thoughts. And we'll get into my my further thoughts as we go through it. But I dislike this book at, a, at its concept for two reasons. One, this is 100%. Like, there's like no getting around it. This is 100% a knockoff of The Hunger Games. That was like, at the start. For sure. Even in, even throughout the rest of the book, it's literally the Hunger Games. Like like the concept. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess the concept seemed like it wasn't going to be the Hunger Games, and then he, the author, found a way to make it the Hunger Games. <laughs> 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 it's really what happened. Um, 
And so for that, like, I think this book starts off at really low points for me because I, I just think it's a very uninspired book. Like, it's a, it's a cop. Like, like I don't know Pierce Brown. I haven't followed Pierce Brown at all. But um, I just literally the quote, I saw this after I made the statement to you the other day. You know how they put, like, quotes on books from, like, reviewers? Yeah. Yeah, the number one, they put it on the front. So there's other ones on the back. But the one on the front says, Ender, Katniss, and now Daro. Like, it's literally like saying, hey, this person is a character that is just from the same archetype of all these other books. Yeah, it's I mean, Ender Wigan for Ender's Game, Katniss yep. from Hunger Games. Yeah, hmm. very similar. He, he really missed the, the name here. should have been, like, Red Game or something. Yeah, and... So I, I, it starts with negative points back for me. Like you, it's a kind of unoriginal, but a lot of books are. The second thing I hate is the fact that I, I just hate the Hunger Games. You know, I hate the, I hate <laughs> the concept. Like the reason I hate it is because it doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> like I'm just imagining some evil, like what these authors do is they invent some like jokingly evil society that is completely nonsensical and would never actually work as a way of governing people in any way shape or form like it's just mind-boggling silly so like for instance the concept in this book that's like hey we're gonna take like we've like they conquer mars right i'm just imagining this evil governor some evil ruler president whatever he is with the big curly mustache and he's got some advisor like hey like so we've got helium-3 on Mars, and we can use that to terraform planets. Mars, perfect, perfect. So we're going to go and send um, some people there to mine it. Okay, great. Good idea. They go and mine it. Hey, Mars is now inhabitable. So let's go there, inhabit it, and then the people can continue to mine helium-3, and then we can distribute that out, and then we can build like homes for the people on Mars that are mining the helium-3. No! No, that's silly. That's so stupid. <laughs> what we're going to do instead is gaslight millions of people under the ground, <laughs> convince them that the society doesn't exist, not build them any homes, and have them mine for us constantly where we make them compete for even apples. <laughs> that's so stupid. Think about Think about the network of logistics how much money this society has had to spend to hide the fact that it's like cities civilization exists above their caves. Like it would be like, that's crazy. Like, and you're telling me you, you have to spend all this money and resources on these other callers to monitor the reds, which is already insane. And they can't like there's no these people aren't figuring out after hundreds of years that oh yeah what was that noise up there oh oh hey like what i understand it's a little further down but like seems like a logistical nightmare you would think that the dude would be like okay here's another idea just throwing it out there what if instead of making them compete for food we can make them compete for all kinds of things you know like if they get the most helium they get a bigger house or they get a nice car. Okay, okay. I'm listening. I'm listening. And then like we could take it a step further. What if what if we just gave them like a little chip for every good thing that they did, all the helium that they produce? And then they can use those chips and turn them in to buy all these things. Yes, yes, yes. Stupid. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, just basic, like what we've we've done i mean it's just slavery that's all it is it's slavery to a very extreme degree while also gaslighting them about society not existing <laughs> i mean if they don't know better right i mean you purposely keep people dumb i mean that's that's how you control but, a society right you keep everyone stupid but the point i'm making is is why like i guarantee you that the society is spending way more money on controlling these people you know i don't gaslighting them from everything i've read so far i don't think they care about their economics 
<laughs> it's just everything's so a weird. battle and that's what's like blowing my mind about this is like so this society would would just never last it's just like built on dumbness and the same thing with the hunger games oh, sir how do we keep our people in line well i'm glad you asked but we're going to kill two of their children every year <laughs> like, what the fuck <laughs> And then you get to like later in this book and it's like, okay, sir, uh, how do we determine who's in charge? I've got this idea. We've got a big arena. We have them kill each other. First, we kill half of them. Okay. <laughs> Following me. And then we make them kill each other to determine who's the best. Seems ludicrous. <laughs> Seems insane. <laughs> Why don't we just have kids murder each other? So clearly, this is the way society goes. Kids need oh, to marry. Population each other. control, Gavin. I don't. I don't think that this is for population <laughs> control. No, that's what the Hunger Games is. I think. There's no way. Two I kids think. a year from each colony. No way. Well, it's no, more I than think two the, kids. <laughs> no, the Hunger Games. Well, two from each district. Oh, dude, don't even get this whole thing is so ridiculous. <laughs> I think the Hunger Games is just. Okay, so how do we determine like what jobs people get? Wherever they're born. That seems kind of dumb. Like, what if somebody's going to be better at something else? Make them chop wood. <laughs> <laughs> they get all these people born to be miners. This the whole thing is insane. You've terraformed Mars. We cannot automate mining. <laughs> that would solve like all of their problems. They've got grav boots. They can literally go invisible in this book. You can't tell me you can't make an automated drill. We've got rovers on Mars right now that are automated. 2,000 well, I mean, years in think the future. Think about it. Their entire civilization is built off a, uh, a revolution. So, And really, there's not that many golds in comparison to reds. So you don't want your minority to be the majority. <clears throat> Here's the secret. Every civilization's been built off of a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You gotta do something a little different. And all right. What? All the minorities in all civilizations are the majorities. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call them the 1% here in the United States. <laughs> like, I just think this is like, it just is silly because it's not rocket science. And some of the things they come up with are just laughable. Like the fact that like, well, who is it in the society? Is it the, not the greens. There's one color that controls um, technology. The blues maybe. Mm, I think, I don't think it's, I think the greens are doctors. No, the blues are scientists. The greens are people that deal with money. I thought. I don't know, maybe. Anyway, the there's a whole the cast of people. Prostitutes. Yeah, the pinks <laughs> are the prostitutes. Which is kind of crazy that you have a whole sect of people in charge of prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's insane. <laughs> hey, and if they're all hot, you know, you might as well put them to work. <laughs> so, sir, we have uh, 12 casts we can divide someone into prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> prostitutes? You want to make that an entire cast of people? You're goddamn yes. right. Prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's so crazy to me. So you have a whole sect of people dedicated to technology. What if someone's born that's like, I don't like coding. I'm not good at it. Sorry. That your dad was a coder, so you're a coder. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid. But anyway, that's the second reason why I think the, I just think. All of this is just so silly to me. Like you have in this world, you have like people called carvers that can literally turn you into like whatever you want physically. And I, I this uh, this is actually sensical to me. But it's like if you have that kind of technology, why don't you just do some crazy shit? And they're like, no furries. <laughs> I'm gonna give that girl wings because that shit's hot. That's my kink. <laughs> Basically, what they do. I'm like, this is insane. Uh, but those are my initial thoughts. I stick by them. 
I think it's a dumb concept. I think this is basically the Hunger Games. I've never read Ender's Game. I don't know how similar this is to Ender's Game. Not really at all. Yeah, this is like 100% like Hunger Games. Like literally, you're divided into castes of society. You're divided up into districts. You're divided up into callers. Each one of them has their own place. So the main character, the difference in this, it's swapped. You ready? The main character in the Hunger Games joins a game and then becomes a part of a rebellion. Here, the person becomes a part of a rebellion and then joins a game. <laughs> That's what happens. Basically, yeah. <laughs> so, I've got, I've done my shitting on the book um, because, in truth, as I've read this, I've almost read it in three days because maybe it's a guilty pleasure thing, but <laughs> um, it's written really well. Yeah, it, it's a very easy to read. Super easy to read. And, I mean, I, I enjoy it. I mean, yes, it's not a perfect plot by any means, but it's, like, gripping enough that I want to know what happens next. Yes, and it, I think what these types of books really do is they take you to a story that is, it's very simple. They make the story really simple. Yeah. So, like, this book has this overarching plot of overthrow the government, which is by and far the least interesting part of this book. What ends up happening to Daro is in the plot to overthrow the government as a 17 year old, he joins the Institute, which all the golds join an Institute, the Institute to determine, or some of the golds join the Institute to determine where they're going to be placed in society. So the rebellion does that in order for Daro to be ranked very high um, in order to be able to influence society in some way or to start a rebellion in some way. And essentially, in the Institute, they take them to a map. <laughs> they take them to like a valley and they they play a game, like a giant year long game. Um, and that is by and far the most intriguing part of this book. So much so like as a reader, you kind of for in, very much so Daro himself, you just forget about everything else happening outside of the game. Yeah. And it just becomes about the game. Um, so that part is really cool. And it's just like, when you get into the mindset of it's just a game, like you're kind of intrigued. It's almost like me. It's almost like watching an actual game, like watching a football game. Like you want to see the next play. You want to see the next snap who's scoring the points. Like that's what th this feels like. And it's, it's a guilty pleasure. Yeah. I enjoy it. I mean, it also like starts off kind of like dark, right? Like you have Daro almost dying so that his clan I don't even know what else you would call them his clan would get the laurel which is like oh you get sugar for the month good for you Again. and <laughs> yeah, find out that everything's rigged that they don't get it the other higher club gets it and him and his wife go off on this little adventure and they like basically get themselves in a zone they're not supposed to be in and then uh they murder his wife like the way i really like how they like describe how they have to do the hangings because they're like well gravity is not strong enough so your family has to basically try to break their neck <laughs> <laughs> again kind of crazy so what do we do as punishments we hang them <laughs> Super draconic, but that's fine. Okay. But, sir, Mars gravity isn't good enough to hang people. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we should make people jump on them in order to break <laughs> on their necks. Yeah, oh. really fucked up. Holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so silly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so they Daro, he's a he's a minor 
he in the beginning he does like you said tries to sacrifice himself in order to get this laurel and the, and they live in this society where like everyone's dirt poor and so the laurel is very clearly a way for the golds and the elites to make them feel like they're competing against each other so they can blame like gamma who are the people who got the laurel like they're the bad guys yeah you know it's a very manipulative thing to do um and EO, who is Daro's wife, so they got married when they were like 16. Um, she is all about freedom. She doesn't like the way the golds treat them. So she joins this um, terrorist organization or, or proclaimed terrorist organization called the Sons of Ares. And she's attempting to get Daro to do the same. And Daro doesn't want anything to do with it. He's like, look, this is my life. I live it this way and it's totally fine. But he loves EO. He's like obsessed with her. And so she takes him for his, during the time that they were supposed to get the laurel, she takes him to this garden that has a dome so where they can see the stars, right? They don't see the cities or anything. It's just a dome where they can see the stars. This place is off limits. So of course they have to hang or they have to like whip these people like 50 times. Of course. Yeah. Like, <laughs> most understandable punishment <laughs> for <laughs> trespassing. <laughs> That's what I hope happens. That's why I trespass. Like, oh, are you going to whip me? <laughs> Wait to get whipped. <laughs> so EO then like goes and sings a, a rebellious song and of course that's like death yeah <laughs> like, whoa, yeah, wait a minute. Sing this one particular song like fuck off like i would love it if it was just like some stupid ass song like some t-swift song <laughs> <laughs> you know what this too makes... late <laughs> killer killer shake it off shake it off <laughs> no that's an illegal song <laughs> <laughs> So they hang EO, and then of course Taro has to do the dunk. <laughs> the <laughs> graphic dunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, and so uh, he buries her, which is also like, fucking kill him. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. You don't bury her. Which is, this whole thing is insane. This whole thing is absolutely nuts. You have these people that need helium theory. It's like, yeah, he's one of our best miners. What did he do? Buried somebody. <laughs> we gotta get rid of them <laughs> so like he gets hung but his uncle misses the rim on the dunk <laughs> oh shit <laughs> so he lives but his uncle also drugged him to make him think he was dead it's just the whole thing is fucking crazy man. <laughs> but so the uncle buries him but he's fine because the Sons of Ares did some sort of tech blackout on the time. So, yeah. like, it's very clear. The Sons of Ares have this power, and they're like, we want Daro, so we should fake hang him. Yep. <laughs> what they say. <laughs> like, they had the ability to turn off the cameras while he buried EO. They're like, no, we we need this guy. Yeah, the thing I don't understand is, like, we know that Daro's dad was part of Ares. Like, why... Yeah. Doesn't this his entire clan know that they're being lied to? Well, that's the this I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, at one point, the son Daro asks the like one of the leaders, his name's Dancer of the Sons of Ares, like yo, how why don't you just tell everyone that this shit's real? And he's like, well, we rebel now. We'll lose. I'm like, well, well, let's think this through. Let's do a little math. <laughs> so you need helium three to like keep everyone alive. And now the cat's out of the bag. Everyone who mines helium three, everyone who's specialized and knows how helium three is mined, is rebelling against you. Are you gonna kill them all? This seems really dumb. It seems really <laughs> dumb. <laughs> if you need helium three to stay alive. Gunna seems like you'd be like, okay, fine. Here's some houses. <laughs> Sorry, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
Like, you wouldn't want to kill them. You wouldn't want to kill all the Reds because what are you going to do? Because you'd have to take some other cast, the Greys, whatever, and say, okay, go mine Helium 3. Well, they they know. They already know. They live up top. Yeah. So they're like, wait a minute. There's just... also Reds that live up top, too. Yeah, there the are I Reds. The I Reds. <laughs> which is like, fine. I don't know why they don't just create a different color. The, like the oranges. <laughs> Yeah, so, images. They take they take a Daro and basically what the the sons do is they turn him into a gold. They they've somehow all of everyone wears like some sort of identifier on their wrist or something and they have all of that that is required to make them a gold, but they go to this person that's called a carver and so they're able to like change the person's body, do a bunch of implants and it's just this crazy fucking it's very cyberpunk super cyberpunk like the dude is like opening this guy up like every day and adding bone mass and muscles and teeth and all kinds of crazy shit yeah and i don't <laughs> this is probably like my my favorite part of the book as far as like laughable moments because pierce brown does a very good job at like writing just and like keeping you going like i'm just yeah. intrigued constantly but there are definitely parts of his books exactly what we're talking about i'm like this just doesn't make sense like my favorite one of my favorite scenes was like the carver is like messing around with some puzzle right and he can't figure the puzzle out and daro like takes the puzzle and he does it like real fast and does like six layers of it and the carver's like oh my god this guy is so smart and then, like, the next chapter, <laughs> the carver, like, gives him a book, and Daryl's like, I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it happens. It did happen. <laughs> he's very, he's a logistical mind, all right? You don't need to read. <laughs> he, like, in, like, three months, <laughs> three months of training, is able to convince, like, all of these people that he's some like high class person. So not only does he learn how to read in three months, but he learns how to write. He learns he reads all of these books, all of these like it's like the most insane. Yeah, like Play Doh and shit. Yeah, it's gotta be like the most insane montage if they ever turn this into <laughs> he's, he's got like five books up and he's going crazy. <laughs> and then he looks over and it's just a scale of numbers. One, two, three, four the goes ABCs. back to Plato. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> you, guys, you guys might be fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I find that part a little unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, fair. Yeah, so he goes through this whole fucking transformation. And like, all right, go take the test. He's like, oh shit, all right. I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> and the test themselves, I have like, I don't even know where to go. What on? Like at one point, like steal some girl's pen because she was like tapping it. And then the next yeah. thing you know, they're like, all right, we're going to cut off the oxygen in this room. And see how long it takes for you to pass the fuck out. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, that's a little fucked up. All right. Next, we're going to shoot you in the fucking face and see if you die. Oh, fuck. Okay. It's <laughs> basically what the test. I'm fucking dying. I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm just thinking of this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and when he gets his test results back. <laughs> He missed one question out of like three thousand questions. Like, how did you do that? I just went up there saying, "I can't read." I just kept clicking C. I don't know, I man. I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> Illiteracy is not a joke. <laughs> okay, I think I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, the tests are, like, absolutely wild. Like, all over the place. He gets, like, dexterity tests. He gets oxygen tests. He takes a written test. 
I mean, it's he does everything. I can't fucking write. He <laughs> <laughs> just like writes his name like really big letters, like when someone's like first learning how to write. <laughs> This guy's a fucking imagine, genius. I just imagine like the administrators that are going through all this. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> what did he write on his? <laughs> like I'm thinking about it, like the SAT. What did he write on his like written portion? It's all gibberish. <laughs> but that dude can fucking catch balls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that guy's so fucking athletic. <laughs> <laughs> Dude is so fast. <laughs> and did you see how he stole that girl's pin? <laughs> <laughs> what did he write for question three? Question three was if you have I'm thinking the idiocracy thing. <laughs> if you have 16 apples in one bucket and 23 apples in the other bucket, how many buckets do you have? <laughs> <laughs> What did he write? He drew a picture of a horse. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) So Daro's dumb, but he passes the test. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what happens after that? He gets the meat as well, they go through a draft. Everyone who took the test, they're like drafted in these uh, houses, which are all based off of Greek gods, right? Mm, yes, they. And yeah, after they get drafted, cool. they go and eat dinner at a table. So it's basically Harry Potter. Yes, it is a little Harry Potter esque. <laughs> they have a sorted hat, which are just people who are like, "Hmm, that guy has the biggest testes. I want him." Hmm. That guy's a short little midget. He's going last. I think this whole thing is, yeah. I mean, he gets drafted into Mars. Um, but I will, I do want to back up because I have a character who was at one point in time my favorite character, and I still like the character, but I also hate the character at the same time. So they take a train to the castle. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm just saying, it's pretty much what happens. They take a train to the castle. Fair. And they're sitting in the train, and he meets a couple people. But one of the people he meets is named Servo. And Servo is just a fucking shit talker. Like, he just, like, basically, every person oh, he meets. Severo. Severo. I was like, who the fuck are you saying? Yeah, like Severo. Oh, I've been reading a servo. Two favorites. Who? Pax. Pax. Yeah. So Severo. He uh he's just a good he's a great shit talker. He is. I fucking love it. And he's just huge shit talker. Yeah. The unfortunate side is we find out later that he's a huge furry. And (laughs) it's it's a pain. Um but so they all get sorted. They get and um the the other part that's incredibly convenient to this story is that every single gold that he's met prior to being sorted just ends up in House Mars with him. Except for one. Mustang. No, he didn't meet Mustang prior. Who was the, the th- horse chick? That was what's the girl? Antonia? Antonio? Uh, Right. Yeah. So all of the people, so he meets a person called Antonia. Uh uh what's his name? Cassar Cassius. Cassius, thank you. Um, he meets Severo and then he meets Julian. All of them end up in House Mars. And they have dinner. And it's like a big, like, flaunting dinner. They're all just, like, it's kind of a weird thing because, like, again, for, like, literally no reason whatsoever, all of these high society people are just, like, huge dicks and they constantly want to kill each other for some reason. Like, I guess that's how humans are. (laughs) Yeah, it makes sense. 
Yeah, and then do let's go through the passes real quick and then stop there mm. before the game starts. Sounds good because that's the meat and potatoes. Yeah. So we get to the passage, and the passage is it's fucking one v one fight to the death, and it's set up to where the top guys go against the bottom guys. Essentially, they'll weed out the weak. And it turns out some of the weak are better than the top guys. We have um, what was his name? Only Pep. one. What was that guy's name? It was it was Pep, right, or something like that? Something like that. Yeah, I don't know. He's not there for long. He's yeah, supposed he was... to be like this really big person. He's yeah, a, he's a top draft. That's what they always call him. They, they say, are you a top draft, a mid draft, or a low draft? Yeah, he was instantly slaughtered. And then by, before... well, you find out later. Yeah. It's, it's I guess a like, surprise. I guess like day one. Of course you knew. Like day one, you knew. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you, it... you had to have. Yes. So, you find out like the concept is like they take the top draft people, the people that scored really high on the test, that could catch balls like really fast. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to read. And they make them basically kill everyone who scored really low on the test. Yeah. And that worked for everyone except for this pep guy. And it's very obvious. That Servo was the one that killed him. That bro. Yes. <laughs> that bro. I like Servo. I like to think like he's a Servo, like a automaton, but that's fine. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And then um, Darrow had Julian, which is Cass's brother. Definitely comes into play later. Yes, it does. <clears throat> and it's kind of like a, brother. It's a big thing for him, too. He's like, you know, I this guy was kind of like my friend. And not to fucking murder him. Oh, Julian? Yeah. 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 And Julian was like a very innocent person. And he was like, I don't know what to do. And I'm just like thinking, oh, I can't believe Julian. It would have went a completely different way if they would have slid the instructions under the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. You know, since Daro couldn't read. <laughs> <laughs> what does it say? It says we have to hug. <laughs> <laughs> you see this year that's an H <laughs> but yeah that is... kills Julian he does he fucking beats the fuck out of him but he feels remorseful yes he doesn't like it which is interesting because like what you get from this like one of the big themes throughout this book is like Daro went on this mission to overthrow his government but you immediately get him getting carved, right? Which is like he's his whole body, his physical aspect, so much about him is is changing. And he feels weird. So he yeah. like pushed to keep his name Daro. They were gonna change his name, so now I'm gonna say Daro. But um now he's killed a gold. And you would think, you know, after Eo got hung, That'd he wouldn't goal. Yeah, he wouldn't care. But automatically he does. So I think Daro constantly as a character is very intriguing to me because you're like, even as the reader, like I say, like you're always rooting for Daro, but you forget as much as Daro does, like who Daro really is. Yeah. And I think that's very well written by Pierce Brown. Yeah. I'm very interested to see how it goes through the rest of the books, but we'll get into the game next episode, which is the game. a lot. It's, it's fun. It's crazy. You need to beat PAX. Sexual. I fucking love PAX. PAX is great. You get to know more about Severo. Titus is a very interesting character that comes into play for a while. Yep. Get the and uh, I'm very interested to see how Mustang goes. Yeah. Because I have my thoughts. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, all these will be answered next week. As always, hit us up on our Discord. Find that pinned to our Twitter at Heresy Lodge. Email us at the Heresy Lodge at gmail.com. Check us out on YouTube at the Heresy Lodge. Buy yourself some merch. And have a good one.